Hello everybody, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today we're returning to Strategic Command World War II, World at War. It is August of 1941, and the Germans' advance into Russia is underway. Minsk has just fallen. Several units are pocketed, surrounded, and at risk of being destroyed. Uh, the, we're advancing on Kiev, and we're trying to advance on Sevastopol. Uh, we have moved some of our headquarters to some of the different cities because my understanding is you get a supply boost if your headquarter units are in cities. I don't feel like the advance is going as well as it should be. We are trying to get to Moscow, but that seems a little bit unrealistic. I guess at the end of the day, my hope is that we can establish a line uh, near, most, near Smolensk that we can kind of hold through the winter and then maybe we can launch our offensive against Moscow next summer. Meanwhile, on the Japanese front, uh, we feel like we've gained a upper hand in China. We've started driving toward Changsha, or sorry, uh, from, toward Chongqing, uh, from the sort of center of the line. Uh, terrain has prevented us from advancing in the south. I don't know where the capital gets moved if, uh, if we do take the Chinese capital. And we've also got our forces in place here uh, for the eventual uh, war with the United States. And again, I'm not really sure how that all works. So uh, there's this whole amphibious uh, mode of transport for your soldiers, but it seems like they can only move one or two hexes at a time when you do that. So I don't, I don't really know. We're trying to move some forces into position here into Vietnam so we can easily get access to Singapore uh, once the war does break out. But we're probably just three or four turns away from the war with the United States breaking out and uh, you know seeing how that goes. Uh, we've got troops in position here to deal with Hong Kong. Uh, so I think overall... Uh, we're in relatively good shape. Our air forces took a beating last turn in China trying to help the ground troops, uh, but it was probably worth it. Uh, Diplomacy-wise, uh, J- uh, Japan and Italy are basically spending everything they can afford. The Germans are not, uh, and I would like to spend a little bit more on diplomacy to try and bring Thailand into the fray. Uh, but again, those are all things that we'll have to wait till this next turn. So we're going to go ahead and end the turn, and we'll see how the Allied turn plays out. While we are watching this, guys, I did have to re-record the audio. It's really weird. So I recorded the audio for this episode last night, uh, and I listened to the audio, and it was fine. And somehow when the video got rendered, it seemed to have corrupted the original file. I didn't catch that, so sorry about that. I uploaded this once earlier today, and... Um, it uploaded with a corrupt, uh, corrupted audio file, so this is my re-record of the audio. Uh, it should be good now, but unfortunately that means we're going to miss out on the gameplay audio and, and some of the original discussion that I had uh, as I was reacting to things as they played out, uh, as they occurred. So I know I've had that happen to me once or twice in the past, but it's certainly it's been quite a while since I've had issues with audio like that, and, and at least issues that I haven't caught. So I do want to apologize for that. I'm sure it was a a little bit of a strain on the ears. If you tried to listen to it, it was probably a little bit annoying that, uh, you know, someone posted a video with uh, essentially super high static and all of that. It was it was not good. Um, But we are past that now and then we're going to see how things play out here. We're just kind of moving through the early phases of the Allied turn. You can see that they're uh, reinforcing their units. Some destroyers here are trying to knock out the submarine of ours. It actually did uh, gave a pretty good uh, record of itself there. It uh, uh, damaged a destroyer and evaded damage there from an enemy aircraft carrier, which is now bombing St. Nazare and our battleship there. So that's uh, a little bit frustrating. Additionally, uh, the British have brought some battleships here down south uh, into the bay where we've got a, a ship that's not in port, trying to deal some damage to that. Uh, the Chinese are trying to counterattack that spearhead of our offensive against them. They're doing some pretty bad damage, but uh, they didn't destroy the unit. Meanwhile, the Russians here are uh, just kind of, I guess, trying limited counterattacks against some of our troops. Feels like they're moving troops around more than they are attacking, but that one unit in the pocket did uh, counterattack. Uh, and then their troops near Sevastopol are launching a counterattack as well against our armor, which anytime troops and fortifications are going to try and attack you, please do that because uh, it's going to be hard enough as is to root them out of that fortification, especially with, with armor, which isn't terribly good at that. Uh, re- realistically, your chances are much better if you have uh, a strategic bomber because they can reduce the entrenchments. And shit! Uh, the, uh, the Soviets just landed a core of troops behind our lines in Romania uh, and uh, could drive on the Romanian capital there. Uh, so we're going to have to pull some troops out from the, uh, from the front line 
and uh, hopefully deal with them there. Meanwhile, the British have moved troops into the uh, Red Hexes outside of Brest, which I think represents a blockade. You can either drop mines there, or if you put your submarines there, they'll put mines there, basically, which reduce your MPP, similar to if you put uh, your, your vessels on a trade route, uh, except in this case it's more like a ship blockade. However, that does make them pretty exposed to counterattack from our naval vessels in the area. So, uh, and I just did put two new submarines into the, uh, into the Bay of Biscay as well. So I think that, that battleship may have made a fatal error. We'll see. We're hoping that we can destroy it. Uh, I think these last couple of turns, the Allies have really been losing heavy in terms of the value of the units that are being destroyed. So their economy is going to really be eaten up trying to replace their losses. Definitely the case for the Soviets. But uh, even with the British there, uh, I'm, I'm hoping by destroying that battleship, that'll, that'll set them back and won't allow them to uh, build quite so aggressively against us. Uh, Japan has a fighter that we can deploy. I'm actually going to deploy it in the South Pacific here, uh, probably on truck uh, to maybe support eventually getting to Rabaul. I'm not, again, given the mechanics of amphibious transports, I'm really not sure how this game is going to, uh, going to treat uh, Japan's ability to conquer half the Pacific in just a couple of months. We'll see. I can't pull this unit back here at the spearhead of China, so basically I just have to reinforce it and uh, and hope for the best because it, it doesn't have enough movement points to get out of that uh, spot it's in with, with the mud. So essentially the, the rainy season has come in this part of China and it's hindering movement. Uh, so there's that. Uh, meanwhile, some of our troops here in the south can move and uh, come up on the flank of the uh, Chinese troops here to the south. So I guess my hope there is um, I can't bomb, unfortunately, because of the weather. But maybe I can at least uh, inflict some casualties on these guys down here so they can't attack as aggressively against the spearhead of our troops. Um, I, I need to... I hope I can move something else down here. Um, what if... No, I can't force march them. Okay, I can force march them into place. I didn't want to leave these guys out here and allow the, the Chinese to get troops on four sides of them, so uh, I had to move them up into that terrain after the attack. Unfortunately, when you force march, you can't then go and attack uh, after you force march. It uses up all your action points. Meanwhile, uh, trying to expand the, the size of our breakthrough here by attacking this Chinese army here to the, to the north of our, uh, I guess, breakthrough line, if you'll call it. Uh, and we did manage to destroy them, so we just knocked out a Chinese army there. Unfortunately, no one has enough action points to advance into that hex, so we won't actually expand the size of our breakthrough, but we'll at least destroy another Chinese unit. So we damaged one unit there in the south near Chang, and we just destroyed a unit there to the south of Changchao. Uh, so that's, that's all good. Uh, and we'll have to figure out what to do from here. Meanwhile, we've got a lot of troops in the north dealing with some Chinese troops up there near Peking, uh, but we also haven't really figured out how to fight up there because of the terrain, which is quite frustrating. Uh, I don't know how long China's rainy season lasts in this game. I really hope it's not too long because we really need uh, to be able to get this massive air force that we have on our, uh, on our front into action against them. The, the one positive thing I will say is that uh, this turn does allow us to issue reinforcements to these air units here, uh, which have gained quite a bit of experience here in China. Uh, but uh, now we can actually give them a little bit of a breather and get their replacements in and, and get them back to full strength for whenever the rainy season does stop. Um, I'm trying to advance on Pao Tao. I've moved uh, an HQ unit forward to Peking, but I don't really have... I, I guess I've got the one unit there that can advance uh, on, pa on, on Pao Tao, the core there to the west of Peking, but nobody else has enough movement points to do anything. I really don't, I guess, you know, the other interesting thing is this game does a really good job uh, of sort of communicating why some of the things happened that happened in World War II. Some of the events do a really good job of explaining the circumstances and that drove the strategies that uh, the countries pursued. But I also feel like you've got the same story with Japan. Like, if you look at Germany, they had some, you know, they obviously they had very good armored units. Japan did not. Japan had nothing to the equivalent of the T-34. I think they had one tank that could kind of compete with the Sherman. It didn't come into service until very late in the war. But this part of the game is really communicating to me why Japan may not have gone so heavy into armor is because, because of the terrain of where we're fighting. You know, we're not fighting in Manchuria anymore, and, and when Japan did fight in Manchuria, they just overran uh, the Chinese with ease. 
Uh, but it, they never really fought in, in terrain, like open plains, at least according to this map. None of the areas we're fighting would really be well suited to tanks. Even the Malay Peninsula, where it's more flat, the jungles basically make it not ideal for heavy tanks. It does work with light tanks, but not with heavy tanks. So I think that uh, that's another area where the game does a good job of communicating uh, why some of the things unfolded as they did. Meanwhile, we've got uh, an army uh, and a, a, sorry, a Japanese army unit and a Japanese sort of amphibious unit here, the equivalent of Japanese Marines, moving down to Indochina there, so they'll be in position to take out Singapore uh, once uh, the war does begin. Meanwhile, I'm really not sure what to do about this whole amphibious transport situation because I really need to get my troops ready to invade the Philippines, uh, but uh, so far, I'm not really able to do that yet, so we'll have to figure that out. Uh, meanwhile, all the troops that didn't attack this turn, uh, because there was really no point, I'll try and issue a few reinforcements here and there, since we've got a little bit of extra money for the Japanese. And then we're going to go ahead and move our fleet up to this line. You see these American ship icons. Basically, once we cross that, the U.S. is going to start getting ready for war, so I want to make sure that we're as close to Pearl Harbor as we can be, so we can execute a Pearl Harbor type raid with the bulk of our Navy against the Americans and hopefully crush them. I don't know where the U.S. carriers are. I don't think they're in Pearl Harbor, um, but if we could if we could sneak up on them too, that would be great. Uh, anyway, uh, we're going to move the fleet up here to this line, and uh, that way they'll be within striking distance of, of Pearl Harbor, hopefully, once the war does begin. I don't know if the Americans have the Asiatic fleet as they did historically, which was like a basically a single heavy cruiser, a light cruiser, and some destroyers in the Philippines. Obviously, because of the way this game scales, uh, they, they won't have, you know, the full fleet, but I don't know if they'll be represented by like a heavy cruiser or a light cruiser out there. One of the other things that you just saw on your screen also, looks like you can replace your commanders in your headquarters with different commanders, which I, I didn't know. That's kind of interesting. Um, but yeah, I don't know if that's just for flavor. I know different commanders appear to have different levels of efficiency for the headquarters, but why you would, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I guess you could pick a different headquarters commander, but, um, what's the real difference? It's not like there's generals in these headquarters that are making decisions on how battles go. It seems like it's mainly just about providing uh, efficiency boosts to the soldiers and also supply boosts. And it's not like a general's going to make a, a egregious mistake that's going to cause you to can them because you're the general. So, um, yeah, I'm, I, I don't know. Uh, my intent here is to operate this Italian unit in Athens, but apparently, and I think it's because of partisan destruction of, of infrastructure down there, they can't make it. Um, I don't think I actually have anyone... Uh, here's the other problem: is this landing of the of the Russians here in Romania is occurring during the during the muddy season, so I can't just you know march soldiers really quickly down there. Um, if I did, I don't apparently have much in the way of troops that are actually on rail lines that we can operate. Um, if we do try and operate, though, it seems like most of these guys are limited in how far they can go, and I'm not quite sure why. Um, usually, it feels like you can operate soldiers basically wherever you want, but uh, that that doesn't seem to be the case. Um, I know a lot of these guys aren't on, aren't on rail lines anyway, which is problematic, but the only guys I can move is this army here and they can only move one hex closer. So, um, hopefully the, the Soviets don't drive on Bucharest. That's a little bit concerning. I don't want to lose the Romanian capital and potentially Romania, uh, this early in the war. So I think I'll also, uh, operate a Italian garrison unit here to block the direct path between the uh, Soviet landing force and Bucharest. And um, we'll see how that how that plays out. Meanwhile, the uh, guerrilla campaign here against the uh, the Yugoslavian and Greek partisans will shift these troops that were in Belgrade uh, over here. Um, I wonder if I would have been better off having Belgrade taken by the Germans because I think the country that takes it gets their income. It looks like Athens is also uh, taken by uh, the Italians. I wonder if the German industry would have been much more efficient at producing MPPs. In any event, Italy does feel a little bit more capable, uh, so that's that's good, I guess. Uh, we'll go. Do we want to rail these troops in from Italy, or do we want to? It doesn't look like anybody can get down to Athens because of the destruction by the partisans. So we may just have to be okay with Athens not having a garrison and hope hope that nobody attacks there. Um, all right. Now that we at least have some reinforcements headed south to deal with that Russian core. Uh, let's head back toward the actual front in Russia and see what we can accomplish here. 
I don't. I kind of want to advance on Kerch and and really isolate the troops in Sevastopol, but I really also don't want my armor attacking fortifications that I should be racing past. I can always bypass Sevastopol and come back to it. I think. Uh, I also don't know what the impact of taking all the Russian ports on the on the Black Sea would be in terms of their uh, ability to supply those naval vessels. But really, ideally, I want to I want to make sure that they can't land troops behind me again in the future. Uh, I did just pull my mechanized troops back. I don't really think I have enough of a... Uh, in this terrain, in this muddy terrain, I don't think I can drive very far east this turn anyway. And I did want to reduce one of those Russian pockets here uh, from being uh, essentially uh, a thorn in our in our side uh, going forward. So we really need to take these towns with these, these Russian soldiers that are kind of uh, surrounded in. And, and so we can release all these troops to move forward and, and establish a, a better front line here. So... I don't want to use my air force against these guys, but I think I'm going to have to because I don't, none of these guys can attack with any sort of meaningful advantage against these guys. So I attacked with that one unit and, and it really didn't do anything. Attacked with another unit here and it didn't really accomplish anything. Uh, I'm trying to bring as many troops to bear against these guys as I can, but it's becoming pretty clear that I need to bomb them. Of course, I continue to just attack them. Because I'm stupid, um, thinking that maybe, well, if I use all of my infantry, then I can I can uh, reduce them that way, um, which is theoretically possible, but yeah. Um, all right, so I think that basically used up everybody who can reach there. We'll advance that army to Kiev, and uh, we'll try and bomb Kiev, I guess. Maybe, I don't, I don't know if they can reinforce those soldiers if they're surrounded like that. I'm hoping they can't. So that was sort of my logic to bombing Kiev with those Stukas. Uh, we did, in, you know, put some casualties on the Russian Air Force. Uh, our Stukas also took some as well. Uh, and then the second raid here by Stukas essentially went in unopposed, but really didn't do any damage. Uh, my fighters can't reach the Russian fighters over there, so I tried to strafe them as well uh, with the different air units that I have. I would much rather have tactical bombers at this point. Uh, but uh, anyway, trying to at least reduce the morale of the troops in Kiev so I can attack them. Um, but I don't think I have anyone who can, like, I'm not going to, I was I was hoping maybe I could take Kiev, a, a cheap attack on Kiev and take it, but it doesn't look like it. I can attack with those soldiers there. They do some damage. The Russians are at least going to have to spend some reinforcements. Otherwise, they're going to lose the city. Um, and then, yeah, so I think by this point, I kind of come to the realization you should have just bombed that city there to the south where you had the surrounded troops and uh, and and worried about Kiev next turn, but uh, anyway. You know what I was thinking is, as I'm kind of recording this, and I know it's a little bit more disjointed because of the fact that uh, I had to re-record and, and the original recording was while I was playing and what I was thinking about as I was moving units around, and obviously this isn't. But what I was thinking about you know, during this, this invasion of Russia is... One of the the features that I really liked with uh, a game called Commander the Great War was this concept of manpower and efficiency of your economy. And in that game, essentially, when you took casualties at the front and you issued reinforcements, you spent your, your industrial points to reinforce uh, your, your soldiers, uh, it would draw from a national manpower pool. You only had so much manpower that you could draw from. And once your, your latent manpower started to decline beyond a certain point, then that, that reduction of manpower actually impacted your economy. Manpower isn't a unique concept to Commander the Great War. Uh, Hearts of Iron has it. Hearts of Iron does it in a different way, however, where it basically says there's only so many men you can draft into your service, and once that, that available manpower pool is gone, then you can't draft more reinforcements. And you can change certain laws and policies in your economy to free up more of your manpower, and that may have impacts on your economy as well in a somewhat sort of abstract way, like, oh, you can do full con conscription, but your uh, civilian factory output declines, or your military factory output declines, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. But in Commander of the Great War, what you can actually do is when you, you, you make that decision by the fact that you decide to continue reinforcing or building new units, if I want to build a new army a new, or a new core, and you at some point you reach a tipping point where, okay, you can draw these guys in, 
but now your economy is only operating at 70%. Now your economy is actually operating at 60%. And, and that number can keep going down and down and down. And you can find yourself in a fatal funnel, a death spiral, basically, of an economy. You can basically recreate the condition that Germany found itself in World War I. Less so in World War II, so maybe it doesn't make that, that same amount of sense. Uh, the German economy collapsed in a very different way in World War II, uh, and it wasn't fully felt because they were overrun on the battlefield uh, before really the impacts of all of that were felt. But I just, I found that kind of interesting, and this game doesn't, you know, despite the fact that casualties are very important and we're doing great damage on the Russians by destroying these units and they're going to have to spend vast sums of money to replace uh, their units. I was I was kind of struck by, you know, as I was sitting here, I was thinking, is there a way for me to bleed these guys to death? Is there a way for me to uh, actually, uh, you know, basically cause the Russians to run out of manpower? I mean, in World War II, probably not, but is there a way that they can do that to me? And uh, I guess I'm, I'm not, I haven't seen that yet. Um, and by the way, guys, that, that was an example of why I, I do like spending money on mobility. That infantry unit was able to move, attack, and then move again. And it would not have been able to do that if it didn't have its trucks, its, its mobility points that I invested in it. So that, that's one thing that I do think, uh, I know some people were commenting on mob mobility so expensive. Why do you upgrade your units with that? You're much better off doing firepower. And you might be right that I'm better off doing firepower. But I still find uh, find mobility highly highly valuable. Um, there you can see it looks like the Russians are forming a defensive line here on this railway to the northwest of Smolensk. It's a pretty unbroken line up toward Riga, so their front is starting to come together, which is a little bit of a concern. Uh, you know, we don't want them to uh, sort of uh, align in a cohesive front against us. That that could pose some challenges if we've got to break through a whole new defensive line. One of the big advantages that we had to this point is the fact that they were largely, uh, you know, separate. There were there were gaps between their line, and I think the way the game mechanics work, it's going to become very challenging for us if we have to break through a solid line of armies and corps uh, at, at any one point. But we've at least outrun the mud a little bit here. Uh, the mud is further to our west now, and we're kind of advancing in past the mud. We've taken... Uh, the town of Orsha here in the south. We're on the verge of taking Smolensk. Uh, we've also taken this other town here to the north. Uh, and uh, my goal is also going to take uh, Gomel there to the south. I think this town to the north of Osha, the town to the south at Gomel, and then Osha itself are essentially are essential. They're rail lines, they're supply lines, and if we lose either of them, our flank will be exposed as we try and drive on Moscow here. Uh, we are going to try and drive on Moscow. We've got to take Smolensk. Hopefully we take Smolensk next turn. So we would take Smolensk in October. And then we'd be driving on Moscow right as winter is about to arrive uh, in November. But again, my main objective is let's take Smolensk. Let's destroy as many of these Russian units as we can around here. And let's build that springboard, which is what Smolensk is, for the eventual advance on Moscow. Then the other objective before the winter is to take Kiev and drive into the heart of Ukraine uh, and isolate small or isolate Sevastopol in the south. But I don't think we're going to get to Moscow this year. I'm hoping that if we have a chance to get there next year, or maybe we can slowly grind forward in the winter. I don't I don't know what the winter rules in this game look like or how they're going to impact us. I'm sure just like the mud, they're pretty severe. Uh, but again, I'm not really sure. We'll keep moving that uh, headquarters forward to keep those soldiers supplied. And then we'll uh, kind of try and drive here on Gormal. We're going to have a couple of infantry units for that task. And then we're going to force march some of these other infantry units uh, north as well to assist on the drive on Smolensk and, and kind of help defend our front line there. But we've finally started to uh, deal with the Russian pockets there. I think we've got all but one pocket destroyed. And maybe we'll pocket Kiev next turn. Meanwhile, in the north, we've got an armored spearhead here approaching Smolensk. So my hope is that we can use that uh, that armored spearhead to take Smolensk. We are out potentially outrunning some of our air forces here. I, I need to see if I can swing them a little bit east, a little bit closer to the front, maybe south as well, because uh, we're really sort of central center heavy. Our advance has been very uh, focused on the center of the line. And uh, we haven't gone as wide as we've gone long. And, and that might leave us a little bit vulnerable to Russian counterattacks. Uh, it is allowing us to penetrate more deeply uh, than we had before. But, uh, yeah, I'm not really sure about that. Um, 
I think the bulk of my Air Force next turn is probably going to be used either in the south to deal with Kiev or in the north to deal with Gromel, uh, and and then hopefully allow us to drive deep toward Kursk or into the into the interior of central Russia, um, because we've got a lot of infantry in the south. We don't have much in the way of tanks. The only tank unit we have is down by Sevastopol, uh, and we've got one mechanized unit. The rest of our armor is all in the north near Moscow, uh, which I think is is kind of appropriate for our priorities. But we also have to reduce the Soviet core here in our rear. So we'll see how that all plays out. Uh, we'll try and advance. We've advanced past the peninsula at least. I think they can bring some supplies over. There looks like there's a road there uh, near the Sea of Azov. Uh, so Sevastopol probably isn't really surrounded yet. I could advance on Kirsch and that would probably cut it off. But it still will get supply from the sea. So we'll see. Um, mainly I'm not really worried about two Russian corps counterattacking up a very narrow peninsula against an army. Uh, so at the very least they're isolated and aren't going to be much of a threat for the time being. Um, but as we've already seen, they can drop troops in behind you with amphibious assaults. The other thing that's weird is how did they move that many hexes in one turn? Do you maybe get the ability to move further with a... Uh, amphibious assault after you've been in the boats for one turn? I'm not sure, but I'm going to have to figure that out for the Japanese because, um, yeah, I don't know how the hell I'm going to advance through the Pacific right now with the Japanese needing to do what I need to do over the long distances that I need to go. It shouldn't take like a month to sail between Formosa and uh, the Philippines, although maybe it takes a month to get all the uh, supplies together so you can actually do your landings. I'm not sure, uh, but we'll see here. All right, just scrolling through some of these units, seeing what I can reinforce. It's nice that I can reinforce that armored unit. Anytime you can reinforce your troops while maintaining the pressure on the Soviets and continuing to advance, that's a good thing. Um, additionally, I think I'm going to move this Italian unit here between uh, their line on Riga and, uh, and the mechanized unit there. I don't want to move it too far forward because the Soviets can just shift up one and cut them off. Now they can't because we've got a tank between us and them. But uh, if I can isolate Riga, that'll go uh, a long way, I think, to maybe unbuckling this, this Soviet line here uh, in, in the Baltic states and maybe allowing us to drive them back to another defensive position further north. We're really not making any meaningful advance on Leningrad, as the Germans did historically. We are, I think, reasonably close to the historical drive on Moscow. But we haven't turned north at all, and I think that really is down to the fact that in the center I've got a bunch of armored and mechanized units, and in the north I, I got one, and in the south I've got one, so plus one, uh, one mechanized unit. So I'm not really advancing as widely or as, as, as perhaps intelligently as I could, uh, but uh, it's, it's the best I can do, I feel like, right now. Meanwhile, in the desert in North Africa, I just realized the British 7th Armored Division has no, or army or whatever it is, has no supply. So we have a garrison unit here in the south, and it can actually attack with success against this British armored unit. So uh, it attacked there, now we're going to swing the anti-tank guns down, and boom, there goes an entire British armored unit in just two attacks by the Italians and the German anti-tank unit. Additionally here, they've got a uh, fighter unit here in the south that is likewise pretty weak, uh, and uh, I don't know what its supply is, but I just destroyed a British Spitfire unit as well. Hurrah! Um, I don't know if that's really going to turn the tide in the desert, um, because we still have two fortifications between us and El Alamein. There's no supply here to the south of this depression, so I can't really just swing around and flank him and go for the... Uh, go for the rear and go for Cairo because I have no way to supply my troops over there. Maybe if I bring my headquarters unit further south, I'm not really sure. Um, the other thing I'm going to try here is putting my headquarter unit into a brook. Uh, maybe that will allow me a better uh, supply modifier here and, and provide supply to the south of the depression, but I doubt it. That was a historical depression that funneled the Germans in and was a key reason that Rommel couldn't turn the flank of the British at El Alamein was because he had this depression to deal with that that prevented his movement of tanks um i think i'm gonna try and push through the british line here they've got a core on the north end so that should be a weaker uh weaker position um but none of my guys can attack it doesn't seem like with any real meaningful hope of success so i'm gonna have to kind of shuffle troops around and move move intelligently here to try and uh, and get an area where I can break through. You can see there they're inflicting casualties on our armor. They actually only one to one, so that was actually not a disastrous outcome there. Uh, my recon car moved forward. 
uh, was not able to uh, evade or was not able to do damage, but at least gave us a view into the rear of the of the British troops here. They got an engineer unit and an artillery unit in the south. Um, so we've done some damage to that core. We didn't destroy it. Maybe next turn the weather will remain good and we'll be able to kind of bomb the uh, bomb the troops there and with our air force units there. Um, that might be useful. Another tactical bomber unit in North Africa would be great. Also, I don't know if they have any more fighter units. Now that we destroyed that fighter unit, they might not have any escorts for their bombers or any air cover for their troops. So if I can get more more air cover down there, I think it, it would it would go a long way to, to showing us some success. But I do think maybe next turn I'll see if I can move that Italian armor unit through the desert and and maybe hit at the rear of the British there. If we can't you know, fully break through or maintain that, it would be great even as a sacrificial lamb if it could take out both those British air units and, and really weaken them a bit. Uh, meanwhile, our, our tank, or sorry, our, our submarine there just attacked a British cruiser at dock and actually did some damage. Uh, I tried to attack with a cruiser there as well. Um, my battleship, uh, I, I can't get all the way to the eastern part of the Mediterranean because it's not going to uh, have the ability to retreat anywhere. Um, if I go that far, but I will attack that port. Maybe it'll hinder their supply a little bit. Um, and then I, I don't really have anywhere to retreat to. Uh, so I am risking getting the Italian fleet kind of exposed here and, and pounced on by the British fleet, which is vastly superior. So I'm retreating north toward Rhodes, and then I'm going to bring some additional heavy units in uh, to the ports in the area. So if the British do attack us here, we'll have as much of rem as remains of the Italian fleet as possible Uh in port so that it can't be effectively attacked by the enemy, but also close enough so that they can rush to the to the uh, forces' aid in the event that uh, that it's necessary. Meanwhile, in the north, you can see the British here have a battleship just off the coast of Brest. We have two brand new shiny submarines that we're going to try and attack with. I know I probably would be better served by escaping out to the Atlantic and kind of raiding British shipping. But uh, I'll take a few casualties on these submarines if I can knock out a three or 400 MPP British battleship here. It actually doesn't even look like it's a high-tech one. It just looks like it's a, a base model. They, oh, well, actually, no, it does have a couple of modifiers on it. Um, so you can see it's doing some damage to our subs, but uh, nothing crippling yet. So hopefully we can bring this guy back. And actually, why don't... Hmm. I'd like to attack that British destroyer there as well. Why don't we bring this sub in here and we'll finish off that... Uh, Battleship. There it goes. A huge national morale bonus for the Germans as well. Um, bigger than like destroying a division or, or something like that. Um, and then we've got a battleship here, so we'll engage this British destroyer uh, and damage it. Um, we've got two other battleships down here. We've also got another submarine. We'll bring the sub up. Ah! Enemy, uh, enemy destroyer right there that's going to attack our sub. Doesn't do any damage, but now, now our sub can't attack. Uh, so we'll bring this battleship forward, try and, uh, damage the British. Yes, we got him. So now we've destroyed a British battleship and a British destroyer this turn. Uh, I'll move this ship He Well, actually, let's reinforce it. Let's spend some of our money reinforcing our navy here. Um, and then we'll move... I want to get the more vulnerable ships away. So we'll move this guy here to the south, and we'll move this guy into port there. So hopefully the British don't destroy those ships at anchor. They might. I don't think I have much in the way of anti-aircraft there. Um, and then we can see about getting this sub out to the sea. Oh, okay. Enemy aircraft carrier spotted. And now our sub can't go anywhere. I probably should have pulled the sub back into port. I didn't. I left it out at sea, but maybe that'll at least cause the British to try and attack that sub rather than our ships in port because I have no air cover over those ships in port. Meanwhile, um, because we still have quite a bit of money for the Germans and we don't have a lot to do with it because our units can't be reinforced if they moved, we'll reinforce our naval units there. Might have been better to, to stockpile that money or dump it into research. You know, that probably would have been the, the longer term play, but... Uh, I, you know, I do what I can. And then we'll go ahead and move the sub onto the uh, convoy route from the Americas there to hopefully hurt the British income a little bit more. So a destroyer and a battleship destroyed for the British that turn. The British also lost a fighter unit and an armor unit. So a pretty expensive turn for the British. And the Soviets are also in the process of losing quite a bit of money on units being destroyed as we reduce those pockets. The Chinese also lost one unit destroyed and one unit badly damaged. So hopefully it's a net net negative for the Allies on the whole where they're uh, getting less in income than they are 
uh, needing to replace in losses. That's my hope. Um, meanwhile, Germany, about 327 uh, points left uh, that they can spend on new units. But actually, rather than spending on new units, I'm going to go to research. We're already researching advanced tanks and advanced fighters. We've already leveled up twice on the fighters, once on the tanks. Uh, I think it would make sense perhaps to uh, also research infantry weapons here to give our, our large quantities of soldiers uh, better odds in combat. Um, so we'll go ahead and spend 175 on uh, infantry weapon research. You can see here we're spending about 1100 total on research. Uh, that leaves us with about $151 left. There's not really anything in here that I want to spend money on. Maybe logistics would make more sense. Uh, but at the end of the day, I chose to go with diplomacy. Uh, Germany has three chits. Thailand is 50 MPPs per chit. So we can spend all of our money on Thailand diplomacy and try and swing them firmly to the axis because I really feel like before I can go to war with America, I need Thailand on my side so we can overrun because when the Japanese go to war with America, they're going to go to war with the British. If I get Thailand on my side, I can immediately race into uh, the interior of uh, the Malay Peninsula and hopefully overrun the British there. Maybe even pull my armor, maybe I should even pull my armor unit in China back out and uh, send it to the Malay Peninsula. They did use tanks there, but uh, we'll see. Anyway, guys, I think that's going to about do it here for this episode. We're kind of moving a few more remaining units into position and, and making ourselves ready for next turn. Um, but I think... I think it's a good time to go ahead and jump in and end this episode. So apologize for the audio mishap earlier today. Uh, I hope if you are still interested in watching this episode that you go ahead and you do watch it. Um, but uh, that's going to do it. Until next time, guys, this is the Historical Gamer saying thank you for watching, and I'm out.